This is the Teachable Soul Podcast. Because we cannot possibly live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves, let's take a few moments to learn from the mistakes of others. The Teachable Soul Podcast, where guests and listeners like you share stories of failure and teachable moments on the journey to success. Here's your host, Kat Daniels. Welcome to the Teachable Soul Podcast. I am your host, Kat Daniels. Today we have very special guests with us, my husband, Jesse Daniels and Grace Myhill. I have actually asked her here today because this is going to be a little bit of a different episode where we're going to discuss autism and Asperger's uh, in marriages specifically. Grace Myhill is a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist, coach, and group leader. She specializes in working with neurodiverse couples. And I have asked her here today, like I said, because we just recently actually found out that we are a neurodiverse couple. (laughs) So I was um, hoping that maybe you could start out by just explaining a little bit about what neurodiverse means. Sure. It means many things to many different people. Um, Literally, it means neurologically diverse. And so we use it uh, at the Asperger's Autism Network to refer to couples where one person is on the spectrum and the other member of the couple is not. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for coming today, by the way. (laughs) I appreciate it. Part of the reason, of course, that I asked you to come is because my husband, we just recently found out, is probably on the spectrum. To be quite fair, he hasn't actually been diagnosed, but that was because at the time that we figured it out, he was in a place where he could not. I mean, he couldn't physically be present to be diagnosed. So how many neurodiverse couples have you treated over the course of your career? I think I'm up to 645. Um, The reason I know that is because I, I keep notes, you know, when I meet with a client and I give everybody a coded number, so I'm not using their name on the notes. And um, I started at one and uh, yesterday I added 645. Nice. (laughs) And that doesn't, that doesn't actually include people who I meet with in groups. I, I run a lot of different groups as well as having my coaching with couples either together or separately. So I have groups for just the neurotypical partner. I have groups for just the partner on the spectrum and I have groups for uh, neurodiverse couples together. All of them are coaching groups and they're intended for people to work on relationship building skills. Yeah. That is one of the reasons that I loved the Anne organization um, was because you guys have groups, if you know, people are comfortable and you have private coaching, if people aren't comfortable, it definitely covers all the bases. Mm -hmm. So um, what made you want to specialize in this area specifically? Well, it sort of found me when I first started to train as a social worker, I was working in a counseling center at Wellesley College outside of Boston. And I had this one student for the entire year And she stumped me and she stumped my supervisors. And one week she appeared anxious, one week she appeared depressed, one week she appeared bipolar. She cried a lot out of frustration. She had a hard time working in groups. She didn't really have other female friends. Uh, She had some long distance relationships, but, you know, had some definite uh, difficulties connecting socially to her peer group. And she was uh, hyper-focused on anime and she just wanted to move to Japan and work for Sony or, you know, some company there. Um, Didn't care. She never saw her friends or family again. Uh, She just was very different from any of the other students I was working with. And so I asked one of my colleagues uh, who I knew had a daughter on the spectrum. I asked her if she thought this young woman could have had Asperger's? And the the short answer was yes. Uh, But the long answer was to invite me to her group of adults on the spectrum so I could learn from the experts themselves what a college counselor should know. And so I went there and the group was great. They told me all about their experiences in college and they kept inviting me back to teach me more. And then my friend asked me to co-lead that group of adults with Asperger's at what was then called the Asperger's Association of New England. It then turned into the Asperger's Autism Network, AANE. So I started to co-lead groups for adults on the spectrum and learned a ton from them. And then spouses were calling saying, what do you have for us? We need some support. 
So I started running groups for spouses. And then the spouses were saying, can we bring in our husbands? So then I started running couples groups. And then over time, all these groups, I transitioned to be online groups. So people from all over could participate, not just the Boston area. And then after a couple of years, when I had my independent license and I opened a private practice right outside of Wellesley College, thinking I'll get all these referrals from Wellesley, well, 99% of my referrals came from the Asperger's Association because (sighs) there were so few therapists who knew how to work with adults um, on the spectrum. The only training available at the time was for working with children on the spectrum. So they kept sending me more and more people and my practice filled up. And that was like in uh, 2007. So now it's been, you know, over 10 years and um, it's just what I've been doing ever since. That's awesome. (laughs) That's super great that it kind of found you that way. That's awesome. So what are some signs and symptoms of neurodiverse couples? Like if for instance, we had come to you and said, you know, maybe we're not sure. What are what are some like defining factors that you look for? So most neurodiverse couples, first of all, they find me after being dissatisfied with previous therapies. They I usually have been to five or six couples therapists. They find that the traditional tools or whatever the tools that work for the neurotypical population, they just found them unhelpful or sometimes even harmful. And so that that's a very common situation, unfortunately, for, for neurodiverse couples that, that there aren't enough people who are trained to know how to work effectively with them, which I'll tell you about later on how we're remedying that situation too. But anyway, couples on when there's one person on spectrum and the other person isn't, it's it's as if they're speaking two different languages. And so the first and foremost common issue is usually communication. And that could take a couple of different presentations. It could look like one person monologues and the other person doesn't say very much. Um, It could be that one person both monologues and doesn't say very much, but it's only they monologue about certain topics and they don't even comment when other things are spoken about. Uh, So there's this lack of reciprocity, this lack of back and forth mutual dialogue. And so that's one of the most common issues. Another one has to do with lack of perspective taking. So there's often these arguments about who's right and who's wrong, about what happened. Even the uh, telling of a story from the two different perspectives are so profoundly different that it's as if a different situation had you know, occurred. And I think part of that is because people on spectrum can have the great skill of being able to hyper focus and they look through a very narrow lens and they see the minutia, the details, and it could be a great asset in a lot of different professions. But what happens in a relationship, if one person's looking at it like this and the other person's looking at it with a broader lens and seeing bigger context, then they actually are having two different conversations. Sometimes the words they use have different meanings to each other. The interpretation of what's going on is very different. And so they present with a very vast discrepancy between uh, the reporting of past events. And then part of that is there has never been repair for the past disconnections. There hasn't been successful apologies and understanding and moving forward from those events. So people will say, you know, we've never resolved anything. You know, there are all these uh, open issues from the honeymoon on, you know, and we, we still just, you know, we don't resolve them because most of the time the people on the spectrum are conflict avoidant. They don't like to bring up unpleasant things. They don't like to have fights. They don't like to have a conversation that they don't think is going to go well. So they'll avoid. And that is probably the worst thing for their partner who wants more than anything to talk it through, understand it, get to a a place where they can reconnect over it. And then the third major issue that I see is a lack of emotional and or physical connection or intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I think people in neurodiverse relationships often have very different ideas about what they want in their romantic relationship and their intimate relationship. Many people on the spectrum are much more autonomous and they really need time to themselves, whereas their partners are almost constantly seeking connection 
And when that doesn't happen, they start to feel like they're the cause or they've done something wrong or their partner doesn't love them or isn't interested in them. And that can make one or both people either criticize or withdraw or Mm -hmm. defend. And before you know it, it's as if one of the people in the relationship is seen as the bad guy. And it's very hard to sort of get them back on the same team. And a lot of the work I do initially is to help them get back on the same team. Yeah. When we, in arguments or, or even discussions, I have had many conversations with him and, and therapists that we've had and things like that about how he has the ability to hyper-focus, like you say, on like one specific detail. And I'm like, but that detail doesn't actually have anything to do with the issue that I'm presenting to you. But one of the issues that he's also had with me has been that, you know, I can get defensive and have gotten defensive a lot in the past. So that's definitely something that we have struggled with as well. Is that, do you think that those were things that you struggled with, especially like when we first were together? We've been together for 11 years, by the way. (laughs) I mean, communication has always been a, was the biggest struggle for us just in general from the beginning, just from the lack of understanding of each other's point of views and especially for myself to not be able to put myself in her, I guess, her shoes and understand where, why she has the thought processes that she has. So, I mean, that was, that's the biggest adjustment that I had to have made over the years is try to change the way I understand things to try and just come at it from a different point of view to see if maybe I am not looking at it the way that maybe I should be looking at it as opposed to like, I guess the point of view from a couple's perspective or a parenting perspective, not just my singular point of view, which Mm -hmm. not always be the, be very different sometimes. Yes. Uh, People on the spectrum tend to look at things logically, whereas neurotypical uh, spouses tend to look at things emotionally. And Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's hard to find middle ground sometimes. Yeah. And I, and I totally 100%, you know, appreciate that about him because sometimes like in certain situations, it's a superpower and it's very good to have, but yeah, we are definitely, I mean, I, I often say that we're on total opposite ends of every spectrum that there is, but also we complete each other in that way because he is able to look on one side and I'm able to look on the other side. And then I'm like, all right, so how can we somehow meet in the middle? (laughs) Yes. That's important. (laughs) When I work with just the neurotypical spouses in a group, you know, I explain that part of Asperger's is this ability to think logically, and there are great strengths in that. But I also, when I work with just the people on the spectrum, I tell them, your partners don't mean to be the way they are. They're emotional. They, their thoughts are sometimes taken over by their emotions. And imagine how hard that must be if, uh, you know, you can't just think logically, but you have all these emotions going on. So, you know, in that regard, it could help both sides build empathy for the other type. Um, And so instead of sort of fighting, you know, they could kind of go, wow, that that must be really hard. And so when there's some empathy for each other and compassion, then at least there's less defensiveness and a chance to try to understand the other person and work out a mutually agreeable solution. Yeah. And uh, that's, you use the word empathy. That was another thing that we had struggled with for a very long time. I had tried to, I mean, I remember specifically like two different conversations that we had had where I verbally explained to him and basically kind of tell him a story of something that could have happened to him as if it were him in order to get him to understand where I was coming from a couple of different times. And at the end of the long drawn out story, he was able to do that, but it took like, I, it, I could, I could see where it was a struggle for him. Empathy is definitely something that we have struggled with. And I thought, you know, originally that he had narcissistic personality disorder because of it, Mm -hmm. uh, because it was, there was such a lack of empathy. But when we first heard that he, you know, might be on the spectrum somewhere, we looked at the signs and symptoms, um, basically. And he met everything, but like one of them. 
Uh huh. Yeah. It's a myth that people on the spectrum don't have empathy. They have a lot of empathy for people who are going through things that they've been through that right. they can understand. And right. um, in my group of people on the spectrum, they have a lot of empathy for each other for their relationship struggles. In fact, yeah. one of them said the other night, um, "Are we all married to the same person?" <laughs> <laughs> um, they do totally get what each other is struggling with. But they often have a hard time communicating it, and especially when they are the cause of their partner being upset, mm. then they don't go to a place of empathy. They go to a place of defense because they really don't want to be the one who caused their partner to be upset. Sometimes they get even angry at their partner for being upset with them. Yeah. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. If he can, if he already has an understanding and has been through something, he can totally understand something, but not usually not until he has, unless, like I said, I've been able to tell him something as if it has actually happened to him. Uh huh. Um, then he, I mean, it still takes him a while, but he gets it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work. I think being in a neurodiverse couple is a, is a lot more work than being in a neurotypical couple. So I give you guys a lot of credit for, for doing that work Thanks. For, for 11 years. Yeah. Yeah, we have. <laughs> so you kind of started the AN network. What is the abbreviation? So it's A-A-N-E and it's Autism Asperger's Network. Right. The Autism Asperger's Network. It was started in New, in New England about 21 years ago by parents of kids on the spectrum and one psychiatrist named Daniel Rosen, who's been, you know, very much a part of, of AANE all these years and the executive director, Donya Jekyll. And so they were probably around for about 10 years before I even connected with them, but I became their director of partners and couple services. And then uh, a few years ago, we were given a very generous donation by the Friedman family, Andre and Rita Friedman, they couldn't find a couples therapist for their son, their adult son who's married. And and so they connected with A&E and they gave a very generous donation for us to get a program going to train therapists all over the world how to work with their diverse couples. So a few years ago, I became the director of the Peter M. Friedman Neurodiverse Couples Institute, which is a program of A&E. And we are currently filling up a map of trained therapists all over the world. We have four in Australia. We have two in England. We have one in Mexico. And then the rest are in the U.S., both coasts and some in the middle. So uh, slowly but surely, we are filling up this map. And the goal is that neurodiverse couples can go to the page on A&E's website, which is aane.org slash neurodiverse dash couples dash institute. And if you scroll halfway down the page, you'll see this map and you could see if there's a trained and certified couples therapist in your area. And if there isn't yet, then you can let your uh, whatever therapists you have found in your area, if they're at all interested in taking the training, um, they can take the online training. It's uh, first, it's a 10 hour self-paced course. And it includes um, 10 interviews with two, with very different neurodiverse couples, uh, lectures from myself and other experts in this area, and then uh, downloadable PDFs and stories written by the neurotypical partners, stories written by the partners on the spectrum, tools and um, all kinds of things that they can download and keep after the course is finished. And then there's an advanced course that is eight classes for 90 minutes online, uh, but in real time. And for those, we have five to eight therapists in each class. And so they are from all over the world. The, the one that I just started last week has our first therapist in India joining us. Awesome. That is cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we actually just launched a course for couples. So we have a three hour course that couples can take if they think that maybe they're neurodiverse and they want to learn more or if they know that they're neurodiverse. And so that's a three hour online course. They could take it from any place on any device, computer, tablet, phone, and they will see nine of those interviews of neurodiverse couples and some lectures and some of those stories as well. So um, it's a great 
way to learn about how to recognize and how to understand neurodiversity in a relationship. And for any of those courses, the link for that is aane.thinkific, T-H-I-N-K-I-F as in Frank, I-C, dot com. Awesome. Thank you. So are, is it just the interviews or do they actually like learn skills on how to cope with things or how to d- handle things within their relationship? So they'll mostly learn about the Asperger traits and how it affects both partners and the relationship dynamic. They'll learn how to reframe and understand things, looking at it through a neurological lens. But then in terms of the skill building, that they can either find a neurodiverse couples therapist to work with, or they can work with me over the internet, uh, you know, for coaching, um, or they can join one of the groups or read uh, read about it. There's a lot more articles out about it and podcasts like yours. And um, there's even more TV shows these days that are showing Asperger characters and more movies. So I think it's easier to learn about it now than it used to be for what Asperger's looks like in adults and especially in the relationships where no one else sees it except for the intimate partner. Oh, yeah. So he's a Chiefs fan, as you can see. And for the Super Bowl, we actually had uh, his work friends come over and they commented on how he is a completely different person at work than he is here at the house. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I know. Because <laughs> at work, his superpowers are like super awesome and they work really well for you guys. They, they sometimes don't work as well here. <laughs> Right. (laughs) And I often wonder, Jesse, do you mind if I ask you, do you actually ever try to apply your work skills at home in your relationship? Not usually, uh, mostly because my work skills can be manipulative, I guess you would say. And I try not to, I try to be genuine with the way I talk to Kat. Okay. Make sure that what I'm saying is is what I mean, not just the parts that make sense. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. He's in the military and uh-huh. he's intelligence in the military. <laughs> and uh-huh. he has used, he has attempted to use it on me once. Um, and I realized that he had, cause I mean, like his mannerisms change. Uh-huh. I realized that he had done it and I'm like, you need to stop. <laughs> That's uh-huh. not who I married. Stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come back. Knock. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> How did you guys meet? Have you ever spoken about that in your podcast before? I haven't. Actually, funny story. So his cousin was my best friend in high school. And technically, we met for the first time when I was 14. And we were sick. Her and I were both sick home from school. um, And he made us eggs. And we watched, was it Jeopardy? (laughs) It was a very long time ago. (laughs) But... Um, he actually left for the military shortly after that. So I never saw him again after that until my best friend from high school and I moved in together when I was 18 and, uh, he wanted to go out with his friend one night, but didn't want to go back to his parents' house like late at night. So he asked his cousin, my roommate at the time, if he could, uh, stay the night basically on our couch. And she said, yeah, sure. No problem. And he woke up that morning and we started dating and talking since then. Wow. Have you noticed that things changed like after courtship once you got married? <laughs> there is <there's laughs> definitely been very, di- very different because I was in the military and I was stationed about three hours away. So I would come back for the weekend, mm-hmm. almost every weekend. So we pretty much dated on the weekend and just kind of talked um, on the phone periodically throughout the week. We did that for almost a year, about nine, 10 months. Then we decided things were more permanent. That's when we decided we were going to get married. And then we decided to move in. So we didn't live together until we were pretty much married. Yeah. Uh-huh. So there was the learning on how to live with each other and just how to be a couple 24-7 after we were married. So the first few years were very um, difficult as just because we're both stubborn. And speaking for myself, I, I didn't know how to communicate well. I didn't know how to see other people's point of views on how things should be done. Mm-hmm. So it's so uh, definitely a drastic difference between, you know, year 11 and year one. I guess yeah. You say. yeah. And I didn't understand his thought processes at the time at all. Um, they made absolutely zero sense to me. And now that I know what I know, I'm like, oh, that's why you did that. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. 
And so now it makes more sense, but also, you know, because he's been, he, he has always been working to, I mean, we have always been working to progress and, and improve our relationship um, for 11 years. So I think that's probably true for any marriage. I'm not sure if it ever just, I'm not sure if you ever get to a point where you have to stop improving your marriage. Um, I wouldn't imagine it would be for any relationship, but we've definitely progressed and become more understanding of each other. Good. Yeah. It makes a makes a world of difference. Yeah. It does. It does. <laughs> so what usually makes people seek you out or seek out the Ann organization? Because, you know, like with our story, I had no clue that that was even a possibility for him. I thought that Asperger's or autism was usually diagnosed at a very young age. And so I, I never thought to think even that an adult would or would could be on the spectrum without knowledge, I guess. Most of the time, it seems that the partner who's not on the spectrum is very determined to figure out what's going on in the relationship. And they really want to understand it. They want to think that it's not that their partner doesn't care, even though it feels like that to them often. But um, so they keep Googling and Googling and Googling, and then eventually they find something Then that is, you know, maybe someone listed characteristics of autism or characteristics of Asperger's. So sometimes that happens and then they have these aha moments. Sometimes when their child is diagnosed with Asperger's or autism, then they have the aha moment of, wait, I thought you were just like our child. And so they connect the dots that way. And sometimes it even happens much later in life. You know, some of my clients are in their 70s or even older because a grandchild gets diagnosed with autism. And so in trying to learn about how to understand what their uh, their grandchild is going through or what their grandchild's parents are going through, you know, the more they learn about it, then they start to connect. But wait a minute, this is like, you know, again, they notice the similarities. And then the third way is that they hear a story, a, a friend's story or on TV or in the movies or something that, again, it, it sparks their connection. You know, podcasts are a great way for people to find out about. It, so it's great that you're doing what you're doing. Um, and once people start to recognize, OK, maybe this is it, they research further. And then once they put in, you know, Asperger's and relationships, I'll pop up pretty quickly in the Google search. And once they put in Asperger's or autism in general, then AANE will pop up pretty quickly. So then once they get onto either one of our, you know, websites, then they learn more about it and see that there actually are resources available. And so they usually contact us with, you know, the first thing is usually like, how do I find someone who could diagnose it in an adult? Some people feel that the diagnosis is important. And some people feel like, it's not. And so either way, you know, I work with couples who don't have diagnosis and couples who do. It doesn't impact the work. As long as people are showing up to learn new skills and are willing to practice, then it's all good. But they usually ask those types of questions first or they ask for support, for support mm -hmm. for one or both of them. And then once they are connected with a &E, they learn about the wealth of other resources and services that AANE has for professionals uh, to get training for parents of children, parents of teens, parents of adults on the spectrum, for grandparents of adults, for siblings of you know people on the spectrum. They really have expanded their services incredibly. They have a life map program, which is coaching for the person on the spectrum, which could be vocational coaching or life skills, just daily living, or how to, uh, how to find employment. So they have specialties there. They have a new program called LifeNet, which is for adults on the spectrum who can't live completely independently. And maybe they're still living with their parents who are aging and their parents are worried, like what's going to happen when we can't do this anymore and, you know, take care of them. And so there's, um, there are now programs in place to help with, you know, where wherever the person can live um, to have a support ne network for that person who, you know, can't live independently. And so with the spectrum being so broad, um, A&E tries to have services for everyone, wherever they are, you know, in the spectrum and their family and friends as well. So um, yeah. it's a great organization to check out, uh, which is, again, aane.org. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I still don't know a whole lot about the entire the spectrum. I mean, I guess so I, I think for I think the reason that he was not diagnosed at a younger age is because he's high high functioning. And I've heard that word, you know, used on top of other things before. Is that the only reason that people don't really get diagnosed? I mean, other than obviously like being in underserved, underserved, underdeveloped communities, that's the word. <laughs> um, things of that nature. But is it easier? Not easier, but like, do people get diagnosed as adults because they are high functioning? So sometimes the cost is prohibitive to actually getting a formal diagnosis. Um, Sometimes there's a person doesn't feel like they want a label. Some people don't want to know. Some people would feel like it's an excuse and they don't want that. Or they think of it as a disorder even though that trend is, you know, changing. In in Europe, they call it autism spectrum condition, and they drop the disorder part. And the fact that they took Asperger's out of the diagnostical statistical manual, it's interesting to think of whether Asperger's is a disorder or not. And I would say for some people, it is, and for some people, it isn't. Just like for some people, being depressed is is a disorder and a disability, and they can't carry on functioning in life independently or have a job or they need supports in place. And for some people, they get depressed and then they, you know, they're okay with it. They still carry on. So, you know, there's a lot of variability, but for people on the spectrum, the use of the word high functioning could be confusing because a person on the spectrum can look high functioning at some point during the day and at another point during the day, They may not look so high functioning. They may have trouble communicating. They may have trouble focusing. They may really just be completely spent because they've spent a lot of cognitive energy getting through their day. And, you know, when they're stressed, Tony Atwood says their IQ drops 30 points. When they're Mm -hmm. angry, it drops another 30 points. So you could see a person on the spectrum who's having a really hard time, whether it's sensory overload or just you know, tiredness, not functioning well at all. And yet they could be the CEO of a company. They could be the chief surgeon, you know, a medical hospital. They could have an incredibly uh, difficult job. They could be in military intelligence. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, and it's something that needs a great deal of strengths and skills and talents. But in a different situation, they may be at a party and can't come up with anything to say to mm-hmm. someone who they're meeting for the first time. So it's very interesting. Never, it's never boring work. It's fascinating. You know, when that. you think about different people's brains work. Right. Yeah. I think that's fascinating for any brain, but yeah, I definitely think his, his brain is fascinating, <laughs> much more fascinating than mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you so much for informing us. Um, do you guys, and you mentioned that you were, was the map, the thing that you mentioned earlier that you were working on? Uh, Yeah, so we're filling up a map of trained neurodiverse couples therapists. So if anyone wants to see if there's someone in your area, then uh, you can go to aane.org slash neurodiverse dash couples dash institute. And if you just get onto the AAN, the aane.org page, you can find, you could find it that way. You can also find me at gracemyhill.com. You could email me with any questions at any time. Any of your listeners can email me with questions. Happy to answer and see if I can, can help. That is great. Thank you. And your email is? Yeah, my email is G as in Grace, myhill, M-Y-H-I-L-L at gmail.com. Perfect. Okay. And if, yeah, if anybody missed that, you guys can email me at the teachable soul at Gmail and I'll get it to you. Thank you so much for having me on today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Teachable Soul podcast. You can find us on any social media platform, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as The Teachable Soul or on Twitter as Teachable Soul. Also, if you'd like to help support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash The Teachable Soul. You can also visit our website for more information at theteachablesoul.com. 